Family, while we're standing, let's just go into the word. And I'll be reading from Mark chapter 8, verse 22 to 25. And it says, Then he, Jesus, came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Father God, we thank you for the word that is going to come forth, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this moment, Lord God, of an exchange. Lord God, that our hearts are already prepared, Lord, for that which you have purposed to do in our hearts. Lord God, that anything that stands in between our intimacy with you, Lord, we release it to you in this atmosphere. We release it to you in this space. We release it to you here and now, Lord God. Have your way in this message. Holy Spirit, move in a way like only you can. Touch each and every one of us uniquely and individually and speak to us in ways, Lord God, that speaks to everything that we are going through. Lord, elevate us. May this word transform us. And we thank you for that which you have purpose to do. I speak healing over this house in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. You know everyone, you know the prayer of everyone's heart cry, Lord God. You know what they're seeking you for. But Lord God, I just release healing over this house. Anything that would be a distraction, we cancel it now in Jesus' name. Have your way. Amen. Family, you may be seated. My message for those that may be taking notes is rejected for a purpose. You know, one of the most remarkable things that I have experienced in my walk with God, and I believe that for many of us this is quite remarkable, is the moment that we begin to realize that truly everything really works for our good. The moment we begin to understand that, wow, Lord, there was a moment where I thought that this very thing I identified to be bad for me and this very thing that maybe I even had resentment because it happened, all of a sudden, there is a moment in time that I recognize how that had been working for my good all along. And then there are doors that we felt like, God, you should have opened that door. But then you shut it, and I feel like I, I, I had a resentment against that because, Lord, I felt like you, you withheld something good from me. And then we look back and we realize, God, if that door was opened, that would have been destructive to me. There is something powerful about a moment in God that we recognize that really and truly things are working out for our good. It's not just a scripture that we, we, you know, we say, but it's, it's something that we have lived. But you see, sometimes, even though we have recognized it in certain parts of our lives, then something else comes up again and we have to, we, we have to allow that experience to shape how we respond. You see, one of the fascinating things about life, the scripture even tells us that God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And I always wondered where this separation between how we think and where God thinks happened. And I wonder if it happened in the Garden of Eden. You see, when Adam and Eve had eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was almost as if it, that allowed, that shaped their perception of what good and evil became. Because ever before that tree, they were naked and unashamed, and they went even in their nakedness. God looked at it, and he said it was good. And when they ate from that tree, all of a sudden, they feel shame over something that God said was good. So there was a difference in how we viewed life and how God views it. But the beautiful thing is that in our relationship with Jesus, we can close that gap. We can close the gap of how we view life and how God views it. And this happens in our walk with God. That all of a sudden we start to realize that maybe what I'm calling good might not actually be good for me. And maybe what I'm calling bad or evil may not be evil towards my destiny. And so there is something so powerful about when we have a moment when we recognize God. It's actually been working for my good. It's really not against me. You see, what is fascinating, family, is that there are certain things that happen in life. There are certain things that we cannot avoid in life. One of those things is rejection. 
And our perception of it will determine how we respond to it and the impact it has on us. For some reason, rejection carries a negative connotation, and I don't believe that should be the case because rejection is not really a bad word. Rejection isn't really a negative word. Rejection is just what it is. It reveals a truth. Rejection reveals the truth that perhaps someone could not receive you or receive your idea because they did not have the capacity for it. We look at it and we think that, wow, somebody rejected me, and we think it has to do with our worth and our value, but it actually has to do with their capacity. And when I speak about capacity, capacity can come in many forms. Capacity can come in knowledge. Capacity can come in faith and belief. It can come in wisdom. It can come in character. It can come in do our destinies actually have a meeting point. And so we look at it and we, th we think it is negative, but really it's just the truth that I don't have the capacity for you. And would you want yourself or your idea or your vision in the hands of somebody that was not ordained to see it? Would you want it in the hands of someone that does not recognize the value? Would you want it in the hands of someone that God never orchestrated for that to be the means? And so for some reason, when we think of rejection, we think it's a bad word, but no, it's just what it is that you, you came to a door that did not have the capacity for you. You came to a door that did not have the capacity for what you carry. It's not bad, it's wisdom. It tells you that, okay, you know what? This is not the place that is gonna work out, so I'm gonna go to the next door. And so today, this passage we read, it may not seem like that, but it's actually a story that teaches us a great deal about rejection. You see, the, the first verse of the passage says that Jesus came to a town called Bethsaida. What is fascinating is actually what took place before he got on the boat and came to this town. You see, right before he had an encounter with the Pharisees, with some Pharisees. And in that encounter, they came to him and they, they were demanding a sign. They, they asked him for a sign from heaven. A sign from heaven that would ultimately, in their mind, validate his identity. But Jesus understood that these people have come to me to test me. Because really, they were not looking for a sign. They were not looking for, you know what, I just need to see something so I don't fall into deception. They were not looking for that. They were actually coming to test the Lord because they had seen too much. They had heard too much to not believe in him. You see, the Pharisees, these were, you know, in their eyes, they were influential. And in some degree, they were influential religious leaders. And they were unwilling to submit their authority to Jesus. They were comfortable in the authority that they perceived that they had and in, in who they believed them, themselves to be. And so they're coming to him to test him. It reminded me of when Satan tested the Lord in the wilderness and tells him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Satan was not asking him that because he needed confirmation about his identity, because Satan had no plans to surrender or submit to him. But rather, he was asking him that question to see, can I manipulate your emotions to move you out of your submission? And so in that moment, Jesus is looking at the Pharisees, and he, he recognizes what they're doing. And so ultimately, they have a few exchange of words, but then he walks away from them. Because he recognizes that these are people that their hearts are not even with me. That they may come to me, say they're looking for a sign. Lord, I just need a sign to know that this is of you. But really, you're trying to test me. You see, this should speak to us in our individual lives because sometimes the Lord will give us a task to do and then we're just like, God, I just need a sign. But you have to be real with yourself in your heart. Do you need a sign because really you don't want to be deceived or do you need a sign as one more thing, as an excuse to push it further? That are you using the idea of a sign as your excuse or really because you're seeking truth? The Pharisees said they were demanding a sign from heaven. I wondered what that meant. Did they want God to, did they want Jesus to have it rain maybe in slow motion? Or they wanted the clouds to dance? I was, I was confused by what they're asking for about a sign from heaven. And so family, we have to also be intentional and we have to be truthful with ourselves even about the things that we are asking God signs for. Have we seen enough to know what he has actually called us to do? Have we heard enough? Have we been exposed to too much to know that, God, I don't need another word from you. I need to just go. And so this happens. He leaves the Pharisees, and he gets on a boat, and he comes to this certain town. 
What is fascinating about this town is that in the scripture, Jesus has actually spoken against this town. About the people, he said concerning them that these are people that have seen many great and mighty works done by him, and yet they do not repent. He actually compared them to pagan cities, and pagan cities were just cities that worshipped false gods. And he said concerning them that if those pagan cities had seen the same mighty works that Jesus did in this particular town, that they would repent. But that these people, that yes, they want to see mighty works of God, but they're they are willing, they're unwilling to change their ways. It was interesting to me because Jesus leaves the Pharisees to come to people that were like the Pharisees. But he was not coming to them because of the town. He was coming to them for a particular man. And even in that story, family, it really spoke to me because sometimes we become, we, we, we think, we have this, uh, you know, idea that we, we are familiar with God. We have this idea that we're familiar with the things of God, and that can be a very dangerous place because the moment we think we know, we stop growth. The moment we think we know this is how God moves, this is how church happens, this is what happens when I do this, then we shut off the Holy Spirit to expand our knowledge about that area. And so in life, we have to be careful because these people, they knew the Lord, but they did not make room in their hearts to recognize that he could come on the earth the way Jesus did. They knew of the Father, but they could not recognize the Son. Because they had put a cap on how God could move and the way, the things that he could do on the earth. They could not recognize the son who was right in front of them because they believed that they were familiar with God. You see, we have to be very careful about the things and the people that we think we know and that we conclude about our knowledge of them based on our experience with them. Because the moment you conclude on something because of how you have experienced it, you limit how God can use it. You see, I, I, this, earlier today I was so fascinated. I was thinking about Moses. And I thought about Moses when he had left, you know, when he ran away from Egypt and he was in the wilderness and he was there for 40 years. For those 40 years, I believe that he was very aware with the areas and every location in the wilderness. But on a particular day, God encountered him in a new way. He did not allow a familiar place to not make room for the supernatural. You see, we have to make room. Sometimes the very people you're looking for to add to your team are right in front of you, but you have become too familiar with them to see them as God sees them. Sometimes the very place you're in is actually the answer to your prayer, but you've been there for too long to see the power, how the power of God could move through that very thing that you see as obscure. And so sometimes we have to take inventory of the things and the people that we are connected to and have we concluded about our knowledge about what they bring to the table and who they are. Because when you conclude on someone, you stop, the list, you, you, it's almost like you shut your heart from listening to what the Holy Spirit has to say concerning that place, that person, that thing. And so this was the case with these people. And so it's fascinating that Jesus comes into the town. And the scriptures tells us that these were the people, they bring a blind man to him. And they beg him to touch this blind man. And what happens really reveals that perhaps it's not what it looked like because the scriptures tells us that when he, that Jesus takes the blind man by the hand and leads him out of the town why is it that Jesus if these people had really if their intentions were pure Jesus would have stayed in that environment you see a lot of times in scriptures when Jesus removes people from an environment before healing or he removes someone from an environment it speaks to the toxicity in that environment so although these were people that came and brought this blind man and were begging Jesus to say, Lord, touch him, something about their intentions were not pure. And this is crazy because perhaps, who knows, maybe they were doing it for their entertainment. Perhaps they were mocking this blind man to say, finally, maybe you need to just stop talking about this Jesus and watch him. He cannot heal you. We don't know what the story is, but what we know is that something about their intentions were not pure. And so Jesus takes the man out of the town. And so all of this, him coming to this town was for this blind man. And then he leads him out of this town to heal him. 
But what fascinated me, family, about this blind man was the fact that when the people led him to Jesus, and when Jesus took him by the hand and led him out of the town, he never said a word. He never spoke. I would think that when the people were begging him, were begging the Lord, please touch him, I would assume that Jesus, that would be a moment where the man actually says, Lord, touch me. I would think that maybe if he didn't speak then, then maybe when the Lord took him by the hand, that he would say something to the Lord and say, I've been waiting on you. He never spoke a word. But the very fact that Jesus came to heal this man says that there was actually a prayer of his heart. That he desired his healing because every time heaven responds to you, there was something that was released. And so it made me wonder, had this man become numb to his own very prayer? Had he become numb to the very request that he had of the Lord? You see, something fascinating, as we continue to read in the scriptures, there was a moment that Jesus, when Jesus lays hands on him, and he asked him, what do you see? And he says, I see men as trees walking. And there are two parts to that message. The first part that really spoke to me was that this man is familiar with what men look like and what trees look like. So he was not born blind. And so I began to wonder, one of, one of the things I love ab about the scriptures is when the story is, is almost open-ended. Because it's almost like the Lord is saying, fill in the gaps. Use your imagination to wonder what actually took place in this story. You see, the very fact that this man was not born blind then, there was something that happened along the way of his life that led to his blindness. And I wondered if when that, when, when that moment started, when maybe the blindness was progressive, I wondered if he prayed. I wondered if he released a prayer to God and said, God, heal me. I don't want this. I don't want to lose my sight. And the more he prayed, the more things got worse. The more he prayed, actually, then he actually became fully blind. I wondered if that prayer was buried under the dirt of disappointment and hurt and frustration and rejection and feeling as though God did not hear him. You see, have you ever been in a position when you're praying for something, you are praying for the healing of a loved one and the more you pray, they actually got worse. And the more you pray, they actually passed on and you start questioning God. I believed you for the life of this loved one. What happened? You're seeking God about something that you believe, that a desire he put in you. And the more you prayed about it, it feels like it just got worse and worse. But you see, something I'm also learning about prayer is that prayer is not us demanding things from heaven. Prayer is us speaking what heaven demands. And so sometimes, I remember there was a particular situation. There was a, there was a friend of mine, and the mother was sick. And they had been praying for the mother to get better. And, he, and when he reached out to me and said that, hey, can you pray for my mother that she's sick? So we got, on a, we got on a prayer call, and immediately I wanted to speak, the Lord is healing her right now. I, it was just like, you know, natural. But the moment I wanted to release it, the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, I did not tell you that. And I paused for a moment. And I began to cry on the phone because I'm like, what do you mean? You did not tell me that. And so when I, when I sat with it, I had to, you know, I, I, you know, just got off the phone rather quickly. And when I sat with the Lord and he said, no, I'm calling her home. It's her time. But you see, we all desire that God, we, no, we, we, we want her to just add more years to her life. Add, you know, do it like Hezekiah. Add 15 more years. But the Lord said there is a divine plan and I'm calling her home. And whether you know it or not, she's actually at peace with coming home. And although she may say she wants to stay, she's saying it for the children, but she's at peace with coming home. Why am I sharing this, family? That sometimes when it looks like things are getting worse as you're praying, it's not because God did not hear you, but there is actually something that he's working, and it's still working for your good. <laughs> this man... I wonder what was the situations that caused him to bury his prayer. And then when I was studying this, I was reminded by something our pastor said, Pastor Sarah. There was a message that she had, and in that message, I believe the message was called the come up. If you have not heard that, you need to listen to that. 
In that message, she said something so profound, and she said, buried prayers still reach heaven's ears. You see, it's crazy that, yes, your hurt and your disappointment may have buried your prayer, but before you ever buried it, God heard it. And one of the most important things that we have to know about prayer family is that God hears you. And in, although he may not respond the way you expect, but there is an appointed time and an appointed response to the very thing that you're asking him for. But everything is working for your good and working for the impact that your life is supposed to produce. And so although this man did not say a word, Jesus responded to a prayer that he may have given a long time ago. Now what is fascinating is that in his healing, the scripture tells us that Jesus spat on him. You see, there, there are two other accounts in the scriptures when saliva is used in healing. In one part, this was when Jesus was healing a man who was deaf and mute. And what happened was that he put his hands in his ears, and then it is suggested that he spat on the ground and then touched the man's tongue and then his ears, and he said, be open, and his ears was open, and he had the ability to speak. In another situation, this was a man who was born blind, and the, the scripture tells us that Jesus mixed the mud and saliva and put it on the man's eyes and tells him to go wash in a certain pool. But never has Jesus actually spat directly on a man's eyes. You see, in the culture, and even till now, spitting was a sign of rejection. Spitting actually, it, it, it was, it was um, an offensive act to spit at a person. And so it's fascinating that in his healing, Jesus spits on him. That what represented rejection was part of his very healing. You see, family, have you ever wondered that the very thing that you thought was negative about rejection was actually for your healing? That perhaps the rejection that caused the heartbreak was for God to heal your sense of value. That sometimes we give ourselves too cheaply in relationships and God will cause it to be ripped apart so for you to come back to a sense of having standards for yourself. Could it be that rejection, that the rejection of the industry concerning your project or concerning the very thing that you want to do is actually for your good, that the Lord knows that if you start to live by their acceptance, you will box yourself in. And all the creativity and inspiration I've put in you would not come out. Rejection, actually a part of your healing process. You see, everything the Lord does is so symbolic. I said, Lord, why would you spit at this man's face? And that was a part of the process. What are the areas that you felt like, God, this rejection was negative, and the Lord is saying, no, it's actually part of your healing. I'm actually strengthening your foundation that what if the rejection of loved ones and people was actually for God to be able to put a mirror in front of your face for you to see who you really are. <laughs> that for too long in your life you have lived by the opinions of people and you have been shaped by what they, by their expectations of you that you lost a sense of self. And so sometimes God will allow them not to see you properly and to push your ideas away and to actually make a mockery of the things that you believe that you're going to do so that you can find a place of strength within yourself. And so it's fascinating, family, that his very healing actually involved what symbolized rejection. You see, the scripture said... Let me even read it that place. So it was verse 23. And he said, so he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit in his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And verse 24 says, and he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. There was something about what he saw, and I want to actually read this. Um, and he says, then he put his hands on him again and made him look up. You see, what was fascinating to me in this scripture is that, first of all, the man, the Lord places his hands on him and says, what do you see? I believe this was very intentional because this, was the, this is really the only account in scripture of a healing that took place in two stages. A healing that was progressive. 
He tells the man, what do you see? It's, I mean, this is Jesus. He could have just whistled and the man would see clearly. Everything is so symbolic. So when he does that and the man says, I see men like trees walking. Something about what this man saw seems to have been traumatic. Because when the Lord laid hands on him again, the scripture tells us that Jesus made him look up. The first time that his hands, the hands were laid on him, he looked up. The second time, Jesus makes him look up. Almost as if, based on whatever he saw, he would rather be blind than see that again. You see, to see men as trees walking, for a long time I wondered, what could this mean? Lord, what does it mean that he sees men like trees walking? And when I, I, I checked what, what tree in particular were they talking about, and it is suggested that he was referring to an oak tree. You see, the average height of that tree is about 82 feet. So when he says, I see men as trees walking, it's almost as though he's saying, I see men like giants. I see men who seem overpowering. I see men that make me feel like I am a victim. I see men that make me feel like I am prey. There was something about what he saw. that rem It's almost as though it reminded him of how he had perceived people and his surrounding. You see, as a blind man, I wonder if he was disadvantaged in his community that maybe people took advantage of him because he could not see what was happening. And so the moment he, when, when his eyes are finally opened again, and he has to see what he has lived, he would rather be blind than see that in, the, in reality. You see, what areas of our lives do we see men as trees walking? And I wondered, Lord, why would you allow him to see this very sight? You see, the scriptures, there was a time when Jesus told the disciples and he said to them that I am sending you out as sheep amongst wolves. There was a recognition that where I have assigned you, that the place of your destiny and the place of your purpose, you would be seen as prey. That I'm sending you as sheep amongst wolves. That is going to be, that yet sometimes it will seem challenging. Because you would recognize that you're around people that are against you. You would recognize you're around people that actually don't want your good. It's just like the people that brought the blind man to Jesus. They bring him to Jesus and they're saying, please touch him. But Jesus removes him from them. Because something about their intentions were not pure. That even in the midst of his healing, he was sheep and they were wolves. You see, I believe that Jesus allowed this man to see men as trees walking because it was him acknowledging the fact, I do know where I sent you. I recognize how, how things may appear. You see, for many of us, God is going to, not even for all of us, honestly, because anywhere that God assigns you to your purpose is going to be a place that you're going to feel challenged. It's going to be a place that you're going to feel like the underdog. It's going to be a place that you're going to question, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't feel like I have, I'm the right person for the job. I don't think I have the right education for this job. I don't think I'm, I have the right background. I don't think I'm the right age for what you're assigning me to do. I don't know if I have the right wisdom. I don't know if I have the right connections, the relationships. I don't know if I have the right accents. I mean, it's, it's a lot on the list. <laughs> and the Lord is saying none of that really matters because what qualified you in the first place was your heart. But I believe that when Jesus allowed this man to see men as trees walking, is Jesus saying that I acknowledge the fact that you are sheep amongst wolves. I acknowledge the fact that you look like prey. But you see, as I studied this, what the Lord put in my spirit is that even when you recognize that you are sheep, when you recognize that you're in a position that makes you feel vulnerable, when you recognize that, Lord, this, this just looks way beyond me. When you recognize that, don't forget you have a shepherd. Yes. That, yes, you may be sheep. And, yes, you may be amongst wolves, but you have a shepherd. And a shepherd who is intentional about keeping you. A shepherd who is intentional about expanding your territory. You see, it's fascinating that the more that you think that you're unqualified for the job, God begins to open up another door to say that, oh, look at this. I'm actually showing you that what you thought was a threat is not really threatening to you. And so what are the things that look like, you know, men as trees walking? I feel like I'm a grasshopper and just in a room filled with giants. Jesus could have allowed him to see men as ants, 
man as a cat. So it could be anything. But when he saw that, it spoke to something. Yes, you may be sheep, and you may be amongst wolves, but you have a shepherd. And yes, people may come against you, and even what may seem like rejection is actually your shepherd still protecting you. You have a shepherd who keeps you. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I don't have the reality of lack because I have a shepherd that keeps me. And so whatever seems to be coming against you in the places that God has called you, you have to remember, I have a shepherd. I have a good shepherd who keeps me. That yes, I may be vulnerable, but I have a shepherd. Yes, this may look like I'm, I, I'm out of place, but I have a shepherd. There are times that God will open certain doors that will make you to begin to question yourself. And God, am I, I, do, am I really, you know, I, do I, am I really, really, really the person that you're calling for this? And he says, if you focus on me, we will do everything and more. So you have to focus that, Lord, despite whatever might be happening, I have a shepherd. And it's so beautiful, the fact that when Jesus laid hands on him again, he made him look up. For me, that speaks to the love of God. That God is so, is so intentional about you that he recognizes even when something seems to overpower you, he would create a scenario for you to recognize, my son, my daughter, I have been with you this whole time. It is not as difficult as you think it is. You see, what is fascinating also about this scripture is, a, is that it speaks to what would happen right afterwards. This man receives his full healing. But afterwards, this would begin Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem would be the place that he would also be rejected and then crucified. You see, it would be in Jerusalem that the soldiers and the people would spit on Jesus. And they would lay hands on him, but violent hands. Because this is when the scripture tells us how they slapped him and they hit him. And, and things that just, it, I mean, that makes us actually more grateful to have a savior that will do that for us. But he will go into Jerusalem and he would be spat on. He would be rejected by the people and he would be crucified. And it would appear to, the, is to his disciples that is this really the Messiah? Because it would appear that these men are like trees walking. That Jesus is now overpowered by people, but it was all part of a divine plan. That Jesus could have unleashed angels at any moment, but the rejection of the people was part of a divine plan. Because it was on the cross that he gained a name that is above every other name. A name that we now have the ability to use in warfare. You see, but if we look at the story as, ah. Oh, they rejected Jesus, and that was negative. Jesus even said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He understood something about rejection, that yes, they, they are not accepting me, but it's because of their lack of information. It has nothing to do with my worth or my value or my identity. They have a lack of information concerning who I am, and so, Lord, forgive them. It was on the cross that we became free from every addiction that could try to hold us bound. It was on that very cross. The very cross that, was, that he was put on by rejection, that was the very place that we gained our freedom. And that is why, family, this message today is very simple. But it's something that I believe that the Holy Spirit will write upon your hearts. That every, every, every place you have ever felt rejected, you were rejected for a purpose. If you think right now, Think about the very things that you felt at some point that God, I just, if this happens, I would just praise you and God shut the door. And think about how much you are grateful that he shut that door. Think about the things that you thought was against you and think about the, the depth of wisdom that it planted in you. If you can put those memories together and you can say, Lord, I remember how you kept me. I remember how you kept me from my own ignorance. I remember, yes, I may have been upset with you, but God, that rejection served a purpose. It is not a negative word, family. It is not, it doesn't carry, it's not, it doesn't speak against your worth or your value. 
It's actually for you. If the rejection of Jesus led him to victory and power, then what about you? What about you? What are the things that God is actually leading you to? And so we have to, you see, anything, anytime something happens that, that carries two different opinions, the enemy wants to use that to plant a seed of dysfunction in you and a seed of bitterness. But God wants to use that very thing to plant a seed of trust and a seed of hope and a seed of faith for you to know that, God, if you shut this door, greater is on the way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Family, stand with me. I want to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Family, I want to speak to those who have misinterpreted what rejection represented in your life. You see, because there are things, like I said earlier, that you just cannot avoid. It's just like, for example, offense. Offense is something that, but you don't have to take it. People will do things that would offend you, not because people want to offend you, it's just because of how you interpret their actions. Because everyone has a way they interpret people's actions. And some things you interpret as good, some things you interpret as bad. And so it would always come, but you don't have to accept it. Rejection would always come in life because not everybody would always understand what you're called to do. You are not called to everyone. You are not called to please everybody. Not everyone is assigned to your dream. And so there would be people that would by, just by life not agree with you. There will be people that you would think in your understanding should be assigned to this thing. And heaven says, I never call that person to that project. And so just by life, there are people that you would see and you would say, oh, man, this is, this is the one for me. God, I believe you have given me my spouse. No. <laughs> and you would think their rejection is speaking of your value. No, it's not. It just means that that was never designed to be. And so we cannot put weight. I heard someone say you will never be the right one for the wrong person. And so whatever it is in our lives, family, you cannot look at rejection and think that rejection is speaking against your value or your worth or the value of what God placed in you. No, it's just that where you are taking it to does not have the capacity or was not assigned to you. And by that, it means that God is just going to lead you. And that's why I love the saying that rejection is redirection. Because by the very right is that God is going to lead you to what is for you. Rejection will always serve a purpose that works for you. It will always serve a purpose that speaks to you. And so I believe that why this message was was, such, uh, was so heavy on my heart is that if we walk around with a sense of feeling rejected, then we will carry this, this weight on our lives and, and it would almost be we will start projecting it on people and we're not going to trust people and we're not going to speak up and we're not going to be bold about the things that God is telling us to do. And you see, the crazy thing is that when you think that rejection is against you, you will stop, you will stop following the leading of the Holy Spirit because you're going to think, oh, here we go again. But when you recognize that, no, it's actually for me. And Lord, if I did not hear you properly, I want to try again. Because sometimes we could get it wrong. Sometimes maybe what I heard was the, was the voice of my own desire. Maybe I heard the voice of my own ego. Maybe I heard the voice of the expectations of society. Maybe I called that voice the voice of the Lord. It's okay to get it wrong. But don't look at getting it wrong as a way to shut up the spirit of God. Because how God speaks to us could come from the, through the same channels where we hear the voices of fear and hear the voices of doubt and hear the voices of society. And sometimes you may get it wrong. But it's okay that even in those moments you can come back to the presence of the Lord and say, Lord, you know, maybe I heard, I heard this wrong. Maybe I, I perceived this wrongly. One thing I've learned, family, is that God will never be my problem. God will never be the problem in any situation. 
And so, if something about the situation is not working now, it's not because God is the problem. Sometimes we have to humble ourselves to recognize, maybe I got it wrong. Maybe that was not the company. Maybe that was not the person. Maybe that was not the place. Maybe that was not the position. And yes, I know I prayed and I fasted, but prayer is not about my demands. Prayer is about heaven's demands. That prayer is about a time when I come in agreement with what heaven said. It's not for heaven to come in agreement with what I want. And so it is possible there are things that you had prayed and you had fasted for and, and it felt like it actually, that the more you prayed over it, it died. And you wonder, God, did you ever hear me at all? You see, what I didn't share with you when I spoke about the person whose mother, when the Lord said that it's the mother's time, I didn't tell them. Because I felt like, God, that is, that's just not fair. It should, you should give them more time. And I said nothing. And he says to me that this would happen within less than a week. And I said nothing. And I allowed them to keep praying because I wondered that, God, maybe you would change your mind. And it happened within three days. And when it happened, he said to me, if you would have told them, you would have given them time to say goodbye. But instead, they used their time to, to, to almost make it seem as though God is withholding something good from them. And that taught me something, family. It made me start to understand that prayers are not about our demands. And maybe I need to humble myself to listen to really what God is saying and to, to understand that, God, maybe sometimes that I'm still discovering how you move and how you work. And I should never conclude on because you did this this way for another person, you will do it this way for the next person. What if? And so we allow, we, 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 we carry this burden and we think that, God, I laid it all down and it did not work out and you killed it, Lord. But what if we were praying our own prayers? And what if we were not tapping into what heaven was saying? God would never be the problem. You see, what was crazy was that after the mother passed and I shared with him and I said, I'm sorry. I knew I was supposed to tell you this, that it was indeed her time. And when we spoke, he told me that something in his heart felt it. But he was trying to push the limits to see that maybe, maybe something would change. But he had a peace about it. And for that, I praise God. But sometimes it's not always the case because I've been there. I've been in the position when I'm praying and I'm fasting for something that God never assigned to me. And I had to humble myself to say, God, you know what? The voice that was directing that very prayer was not the voice of the Holy Spirit. It was the voice of my ego. And sometimes God would answer it in a different way when he purifies the desire and the intention. And that's what I love about worship because when we worship God, when we worship, it, when we worship and, and present our requests unto the Lord, worship purifies the intention. All of a sudden, I'm like, God, I really don't want that. And I begin to see where that desire came from. It is never that God will reject, some, will, will, will withhold something good from you or God will, God will cause something good to, to, to reject you. That would never be the case. We serve indeed a very good God. And sometimes we just have to trust and we just have to be patient and we just have to know that, God, I may not understand your ways because your ways are not my ways. But the more I walk with you, I close that gap. The more I experience you, the more I, 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 I commune with you, the more I am intimate with you, I begin to close that gap. I begin to understand how you see life. I begin to have peace concerning the ways you move because I recognize that it would always be for me. Family, if you're in this house and there were things that you felt that you were holding against God because you felt like, God, you should have done this. I prayed and I fasted and, and, and nothing came out of it. I want you to come down because the Lord is healing your heart right now. Thank you, Jesus. 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 And there are two cases to this because in some cases, 
For some of you, the Lord will reveal that that was never my voice that led you to make that prayer. And in other cases, the Lord is speaking to you that I do answer buried prayers. That if I can resurrect people, I can resurrect your prayers. You see, for some of you, doors are going to open that would shock you because you were not expecting it. But the Holy Spirit will remind you that this was a prayer that you buried. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Family, if you're in this house and you misunderstood what rejection is actually doing in your life, you saw it as against you. And the Holy Spirit is touching your heart to recognize that it's always for you. God will always be for you. If that is you, I want you to come down. The Lord is healing hearts tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You see, the reason I'm calling you down to the altar is because when you, when, you, when you acknowledge what was taking place, the enemy cannot function in light. When you acknowledge that, God, indeed, I was hurt. When you acknowledge that, God, you know what, I, 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 I had this expectation of you. When you acknowledge what was happening in your heart, you give God permission to heal you. But if you hide it from God... You cannot, you, you see, one, a misconception that we have is that God wants us to pretend we're okay. That, you know, let the weak say I'm strong, but you have to recognize you're weak. It's not a thing of hiding your weakness to just say, God, you are my strength. No, you have to recognize I am weak to say that I am strong. And so you cannot hide your pain from God and think that that's what he wants. He already knows it, but he needs you to acknowledge it so he can heal you. Because if you hide it from him, the enemy works in darkness. He builds in darkness. And so if you hide and you withhold it from him, you just give room for the enemy to continue to build. He builds where you cannot see him. The moment you see him, he's exposed and he has no place to stay. The moment you recognize, oh, that is ego, it, it, it can no longer exist. The moment you recognize, I did this out of pride, you will not continue to do it because who is actually excited about being prideful? But if you hide it and you cover it up and you want to keep this image, you give the enemy more ground in your life. And for that reason, I'm calling you to come down to the altar. That every step you take, it's actually about what is taking place be in between you and God. It's not about people. That the moment you say, you know what, I don't care about how people are going to perceive me. That the moment you walk out, you say, God, I do acknowledge something went wrong. And I'm walking out because I'm taking a step of faith and saying that, Lord, I'm going to believe that every rejection was actually working for my good. And I'm going to believe that, yes, there may have been things that I believed you for and I thought it was supposed to happen and it didn't. But it could be so many different things. Lord, maybe... You're revealing to me that that was never you. Or maybe that was it's the, the response is for an appointed time and I just have to trust you. Either way, it's about just coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, if I'm wrong, you let me know. One of the most powerful things you can do is to never be too attached to a prayer. Never be too attached to it that you don't hear what, if it's from God or not. Never be too attached to a certain request that you don't, you don't discern where it's coming from. You don't discern your intention. And so when you can give it room for the Holy Spirit, you can say, God, I know there is a desire in my heart for this thing, but you show me. If you want me to let it go, God, I will let this thing go in a heartbeat. But if you tell me that this is mine, I would relentlessly pursue after it. And I will come every day seeking you and covering it in prayer. But I never want a prayer request to have hold of my heart more than you do. I never want a thing that I'm asking for, I'm looking for to have a greater weight on my heart than you do, Lord. I don't want things to have me. I want you to have all of me. We were singing in worship, God, give me a heart abandoned. That everything, that all I want is you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
some of you in this house, you may be at the altar, I don't know, or some watching. Because of the circumstances that have surrounded your life, for some of you, you didn't even want to come to church today. But because of the circumstances that surrounded your life, you have been rejecting the knock of the Holy Spirit. You have been pushing God out. You've been pushing away his leading because you just feel like, how can a good God allow this to happen in my life? But family, if you haven't experienced this, trust me, the longer that you walk with God or the longer that you live, you would recognize that everything really works together for the good. Every single thing. You would learn that God is not a waster. God does not waste any experience you've ever been through. God does not waste any heartbreak. He does not waste any pain. He does not waste any tears. Every single thing works together for your good. But because of the circumstances that surrounded your life, you have rejected the knock of the Holy Spirit. And let this be an opportunity, family, that you are willing and you are bold to say, God, step into my life. Step into my heart. I want to make you my Lord. That you're, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I no longer want to walk with this weight of feeling like everything is against me. The world is against me. And you're against me. God drew you to this house because he's calling you home. He's calling you home. He wants to make your heart his his home and so if you're not at the altar I want you to come down to this altar thank you Jesus thank you Jesus God sees you thank you Jesus thank you Jesus hallelujah and for those that are watching I just want you to lift your hands up father God we thank you for that which you're doing right now we thank you that you're healing hearts we thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. The Spirit of God is moving. You're healing hearts, Lord God. You're healing minds, Lord God. You're rewriting history. You're allowing your children to see that, no, that was never against you. Oh, that was actually for me. When this incident happened, oh, it was actually not against me. It was actually for me. Wow, April 20th was not the worst day of my life. It was actually one of the best days. Lord, you're rewriting history. Thank you, Lord. Have your way in the lives of your sons and your daughters. Write this on your hearts, Lord God. May this day, may what is taking place right now at the altar, Lord God, may it be imprinted on their hearts. Lord God, may they never depart from it. And I cancel every attack of the enemy that will cause them to, that will make them feel like that, that, that no, things are maybe against me, but they would recognize that when I feel like sheep, when I feel vulnerable, when I feel like I'm amongst men walking as trees, that I would remember that I have a shepherd, a shepherd that keeps me. We thank you, Lord, that every rejection is actually working together for our good. And I thank you, Lord, for those that took a step of faith and said, Lord, no longer would I block out your spirit. No longer would I block out the leading of your spirit, but I recognize that you are for me. And I would resolve in my mind that you would never be the problem. So that I would open my heart to know more of you and to grow in you, Lord God. I thank you, Jesus, that you will speak to your children. That every seed of bitterness is being pulled out right now. Every root of bitterness is being uprooted right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, that they would not walk as though everything is okay on the surface and dying on the inside. Lord, I thank you that joy would spring up from within. I thank you that joy will spring up from within. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord that is not attached to anything or any place or any person, but a joy that is rooted in knowing you, Lord Jesus. A joy that is rooted in intimacy with you. I thank you, Lord, that a joy will spring up from within your children. And it will be their strength. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen.